Hello and very welcome as well from my uh, side. It's our first webinar on our census and I'm really happy that we can share today with you a very interesting dynamic but in the same time challenging genome first approach and how this may go and lead to a diagnostic um, yield. So what drives us, what motivates us at our census? Well, we all of us believe that good health should not be a matter of luck, rather a matter of informed action. So we empower people with genomic and medical insights to understand and improve their health to achieve great and lasting quality of life and save lives. How would we like to do that? Well, at, at um, our census, we have identify the whole genome sequencing as one fits all approach. The fact that whole genome sequencing is superior and at the same time its benefits on clinical diagnostic is not new. So there are a lot of publications, if you go on PubMed, which we can find that whole genome sequencing has some benefits compared with either gene panels or with exome sequencing. What that means, that means by doing whole genome sequencing, we can understand medical conditions and even go beyond medical. So, of course, that the whole genome sequencing has undergo a massive transition into an approach that has a broad application in clinical and medical settings. Every day is transforming our knowledge of biology from rare disease to cancer and beyond, and has resolved etiology of a disease for previously undiagnosable conditions and identify cancer driver genes variants. Genomics is just a, a small part from a much larger, broader approach, which, which is a multi-omics approach. Multi-omics will imply big data. And when we talk about big data, means that we need as well to follow strictly some requirements. It has to be fast, it has to be scalable, it has to be affordable, but at the same time must be secured. And during this process, we need strictly to follow some regulations like GDPR and HIPAA. And at the end, we need to have this data available almost nonstop. So now, just let me a little bit to give an example, which is simple, but at the same time relevant, why our census is planning and has been already started to integrate the whole genome sequencing into a more broad um, aspects from medical as well, but as well health. So um, nowadays, I think all of us will wear a uh, smartwatch. And with this kind of device, you can, of course, monitor a lot of things like sleep, but in the same time, for example, you can monitor the heart rate. So um, you can imagine that whenever this data is stored in the smartwatch, you can as well sometimes identify some issues are detected. So um, what we can do, you can, of course, say, okay, I would like to understand why? So the reason why I have these heart uh, problems, and you can of course um, take the whole genome sequence into the screen for genes which are related to the heart diseases. You should know as well that five in ten thousand, if you are talking about Western countries, or twelve in ten thousand, if we are talking about South East, East Asia, are um, at risk to develop a so-called sudden cardiac death syndrome or Brugada syndrome, which means that you can be healthy or you can feel healthy, you're as well young, but you don't know you have a, such a genetic, genetic risk to develop a, such a very, um, you know, severe disease. So what you can do if you know that you have a, such a genetic risk, you can go to your cardiologist, your own doctor and say, okay, I have done this test and I have this genetic risk. So your physician, what can do together with you is to really go to the preventive action. And let's just remember that this year during the European Championship, um, this famous um, football player, Christian uh, Eriksson, 
has collapsed during the official football game. The luck was that it happened uh, in the such an official game where first aid was there. So you can imagine that this may happen in a completely different context or under other circumstances. It could happen driving, cycling. And in this situation, maybe the luck uh, will not be you know, saving your life. So what it means, that means even if you are healthy, feel healthy, and if, if you go to such intensive um, examinations like the football player goes, so you can't think you are at risk. So which means at the end, as prevention, if you know you can go, you know, on a very, I would say, simple action, your cardiologist can uh, provide you, meaning a small device you can wear under the skin and in case of cardiac um, attack will save your life. And then doesn't matter if you have or not immediate help available, you are going to survive. So which at the end, we really strongly believe that all of us should have in our hand the power to decide what to do with the information we receive and be more proactive and not waiting that the symptoms should appear to have a reason to go to our physician. So now going back to our um, topic of the webinar, I would like to introduce to you the diagnostic yield uh, using a very interesting and valuable population cohort we have at our sense, namely the Pakistan population. And I will explain to you a bit later why it's so important to have a such interesting population in your own data set. And I think a lot of you will may know why this population is for genetic uh, point of view so interesting. Unfortunately, so Pakistan has the worst infantive mortality rate in the world. And the main reason is that 73% of the Pakistani population will be in a consanguinity marriage. What that means? That means um, blood related individuals, we get married together. And in this situation, some genetic mutations will accumulate, leading to a such, unfortunately, um, high rate mortality for infants in Pakistan. So in, 2000, in uh, this year, 2021, it is estimated that 58 deaths will occur in 1,000 live births. So our cohort at our census um, currently includes four Pakistani sites. So Islamabad, Lahore, Peshawar, and Mal Multan. And in total, we have uh, succeeded to collect 407 families comprising almost 1,300 individuals. In uh, our cohort, we have observed a consanguinity rate of 85%. Look at the index province, we observe that 63% of them are represented by males. But when you look at the age of uh, diagnosis, you don't see any difference between age of diagnosis between females and males. And we are talking about almost five years, um, you know, the age when these patients are diagnosed. And if you look at the age class distribution, the majority of them are represented by children. So we have just a few um, adult affected individuals, most of them being younger than 10 years old. When we look at the clinical information we receive from the clinician, you have here like the top 10 um, HPO terms. HPO stays for human phenotype ontology. So we translate the symptoms physicians share with us into a, such a standardized uh, nomenclature. And you may see that the first five, for example, most encountered clinical information comprises global developmental delay, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, seizures, failure to thrive, delayed speech and language development. 
The year we have uh, accumulated in our um, Pakistani data set, a number of 424 unique HPO terms, and we have in total almost 3,000 HPO occurrences. So what was our approach to diagnose this uh, patient? So we have um, initiated the whole genome sequencing and in the end, we end up with a very high diagnostic yield, almost 80%. So you have here the uh, pie of the data distributed, and you'll see that 63% of them had a confirmed diagnosis, and 16 of them, 16%, are currently under um, clarification. Um, and we have now approached um, Sanger, for example, sequencing to confirm the presence and, been, of course, uh, the phase of some um, pathogenic uh, variants. In total, we have identified 10 copy number variations. And this is as well um, my message that whole genome sequencing can be as well used to detect gross rearrangements. Usually you will um, may consider to go on another method like CGH arrays or um, karyotyping, but we could successfully implement the detection of copy number variation as well by using um, whole genome sequencing. And you have here in this table, the most um, confirmed diseases in our Pakistani cohort and you will see that Wilson disease or progressive familiar cholestasis type three are the most to uh, confirm diagnosis in our cohort. Next, I would like to, just a second, again, the slide. Okay, so now we have um, the slide. So next, why is it so important to understand the uh, Pakistani genome? Well, I think we have, all of us have the same issue, namely the current human genome reference we are using, it is a Caucasian-based um, reference meaning that a lot of other populations, subpopulations are underrepresented in this um, genome. So that's why we have already um, initiated our work towards a global reference genome and variome. If we can understand better the, for example, Pakistani genome, we can make a better um, diagnosis. Why? Because we will know which variants are um, causing specific phenotypes. And at the same time, we may have as well the chance to identify faster novel genes. And we have here in this graph a representation of our Pakistani cohorts against the um, origin of the, um, of the sample. And what we started now to do is to cluster them. And you see, because we use here the uh, origin of the sample collection or of the site, but you see as well in all these four uh, sites that we form subclasses, which means we can as well identify outliers. It's really important to understand the ethnicity of them, since there are coming more and more papers and publications and insights showing that some mutations, some variants will have impact on phenotype, um, depending on the ethnical background of the patient. So we have already initiated and um, implemented in our human genome reference, the so-called Pakistano. And um, here, just to uh, explain more uh, into the details why it's so important. So um, currently, if we just look at the clinical genome, which represents 4% of the genome, so we have identified more than 1,500 million variants, and almost 20% are novel variants. What that mean? That means you can't find them in any other source. It is important to understand that these novel variants may lead to misdiagnosis if they are not um, accordingly evaluated. And I have here these two bars with high and moderate. 
where uh, we took, for example, the high predicted novel variants and then map them against the local frequency. So less than 1% and higher than 1%. And you will see that 80% of the high predicted variants are in fact common in the Pakistan tunnel. Which means if you will find a, such a high impact mutation in a patient and then compare it against the um, external databases you might have available, you might assign, if we are following the ACMG guidelines, the PBS1 rule, if it is a high predicted uh, mutation in a loss of function gene, and you might as well assign PM2, which means it's rare just because you don't find it, right? So based on the allele frequency, you may consider this is a rare, high predicted um, mutation. But if you look at the relevant cohort in this situation, the Pakistani cohort, you will see that in this cohort, in fact, turns to a common variant. So the missed agnosis, um, it is really high if you are not aware that the database you are looking at, the source is not relevant for your own uh, patient. That's why the ethnical background of each patient counts and must be considered whenever we look at the um, genetic interpretation and at the end um, agreeing or disagreeing to report or not the variant. And this is just the data I'm showing to you concerning the Pakistan. A Pakistan home. Now, I would like, of course, to go through some examples that you as well understand how we, our census, apply all this knowledge we gather from, um, from Pakistani cohort. So here I have the first case, which is a male of eight years, and you have also the pedigree here on the right side. So we have in this situation a non-consanguineous family, so we don't have a marriage um, between the um, family-related people, and you will see that out of five uh, kids, three are affected. And we have analyzed all three by whole genome sequencing. It's really interesting, if you look at the clinical picture, um, and you see all these clinical symptoms like the behavioral abnormality, ataxia, autism, brain atrophy, and so on. You will see that the age of onset started or appeared at 1.5 years. And the clinical suspicion was mucopolysaccharidosis type 3. So keep this in your mind. So we have analyzed these three um, affected individuals via genome sequencing, and at the end, we could not confirm the presence of the MPS3 disease. But what we found instead were two copy number variations. So one monosomy of the chromosome 18 and one duplication of the um, partial um, duplication of the chromosome um, 13. And you have here on the right as well how we saw it in our um, variant analysis software. And at the end, we could confirm the presence of the monosomy, partial monosomy, and partial chromosomes free Q duplication. Really interesting. If you look at the literature and go to gene reviews, for example, source, you will see that most of these um, chromosomal rearrangements are coming via de novo rearrangements. Um, since we had in one family more than just one patient affected, um, we have suspected a parental rearrangement. And we know, as well from publications, that balanced translocation, which may happen in the parents, normally does, no, does not cause any signs or symptoms, but it increases the risk of having affected uh, children. That's why we also recommended the parental and affect, um, the parental and the um, for the affected individuals karyotyping, in order to establish the presence of either balanced or imbalanced uh, chromosomal rearrangement. Now coming to the case number two. Um, here we have again a non consanguineous family. In this family, you, you see three miscarriages. 
And our patient, which we have analyzed together with the parents uh, through the whole genome sequencing, which unfortunately uh, died at the age of three months. So um, the clinical picture included like seizure, hypotonia, areflexia, encephalopathy, and some metabolical uh, abnormalities. And this is the age of onset, it was in the first week of life. And the clinical suspicion was a hypoglycinemia non-ketotic, which is an autosomal recessive um, disorder. So by applying the whole genome sequencing, what we have identified is a de novo mutation in Pura gene. And you have here as well a screenshot of our um, tool. And you see that this variant was absent from the mother and the father. And at the end, we have confirmed at genetic level the presence of completely different disorder, which is the autosomal dominant neurodevelopmental disorder with neonatal respiratory insufficiencies, hypotonia, feeding difficulties. And as I said, confirming to be to rise de novo in this patient. So um, again, what we did using the whole genome sequencing, it was to confirm the presence of another clinic uh, of another um, disease, not that one which has been initially suspected. And here on the dark blue side, we have some suggestive findings for a, such a disorder for in infants like hypotonia, neonatal hypoventilation, hypothermia, hyposomnolence, and so on. Our last case for today is a nine years old boy. In this situation, we have a consanguineous family and the patient showed um, jaundice, diarrhea, nausea, hepatomegaly and abdominal pain. The symptoms started with the age of two and the initial clinical suspicion was job syndrome or hyperimmunoglobulin E syndrome. So we have analyzed by whole genome sequencing the index patient. And we have identified um, likely pathogenic variant in the CD55 gene, gene which is known to cause autosomal recessive complement hyperactivation, angiopathic thrombosis, and protein losing enteropathy, or shortly CHAPO. So um, now, what we can summarize for this case is that for seven years, this case has been uh, suspected of Job syndrome. You could alternatively um, screen this patient using immune and cytopenia panel. Usually there are more than 600 genes known to be associated with this, um, with this uh, medical condition. And not all the panels, that's why I have it here, it might include CD55. So not all the panels by design will include this gene. So at the end, we have confirmed the presence of um, another disease as if we compare with the suspected one. So, um, which is now the um, entire message I would like to share with you. Unfortunately, this is a real um, burden for all these families and patients. And we could confirm indeed that the most of these patients are children. And unfortunately, 30% of them will never reach their fifth birthday. And this is, for example, the situation for our second case. Now you will see that the common statistic you may find on the internet, they talk about five years delay in diagnosis. Unfortunately, for the two cases I just introduced to you today, we have more than that. So which means in real life, the delay diagnosis may take longer. In our situation, we have from seven to eight years delay. So what can we do? Um, and we, all of us, believe that we need to empower people to take their personal health into their own hands. Um, how? By, you know, approaching the direct-to-consumer um, model and at the same time to promote awareness that the genetic diseases exist and at the same time that you could as well 
ask by yourself for such a test. And you don't need, uh, require any approval from healthcare provider or health insurance. And it's uh, quite often less expensive than genetics. And at the same time, it's again, I know I will repeat myself, but it's okay. One fits all approach is one of the driver towards personalized medicine. Well, unfortunately, it took us a pandemic to realize that today's approach um, to healthcare is dysfunctional and outdated. And if we just take another example, for example, the Americans, yeah, so the average American um, has a life expectancy of 78, and they retire 66 years. And this is actually three years after they encounter one of the big four diseases, cardiovascular cancer, Alzheimer, or type 2 diabetes, and these can be changed. Globally speaking, more than 500 million people are affected by rare genetic disorders. And this must be changed, especially since we know and we could as well confirm diagnosis takes an average six to eight years. Um, so what we would like to do is to help shifting this approach, treating the sick towards more proactive action. Because unfortunately today, we go to the doctor when we have problems and this should be changed. So our solution to this problem is to redefine personal health from the ground up by combining digital health and whole genome sequencing. And the, by combining the whole genome sequencing, the digital technology, the artificial intelligence, we make genetics a major driver of health insight and personalized healthcare. So with this slide, I would like to thank you very much for your um, attention and more than happy to answer your question.